And we're back. Welcome back, and happy Tuesday. Today, we will switch gears a little bit and talk about an important aspect related to machine learning, uh, entropy and information. But before we begin, a few administrative bits. We will have a reading on entropy as the following URL lists, and we'll also have a reading on decision trees, a machine learning model that makes use of entropy. These are both on the course Blackboard. Why don't we begin? So when we talk about information, what actually do we mean? Well, here is a picture of randomness. There is no information in here. Here's another picture, and this picture is quite different from the one on the previous page. This has information. You can see trees, you can see fields, you can see fences. So what makes this different from the first picture? Well, the first picture doesn't have really any discernible structure. The second picture has structure. The choice of one pixel relative to another pixel is not arbitrary here. And that's what makes something a picture of a tree or a field, whereas here, this is just random values associated with pixels next to other random values associated with pixels. So this is this idea of structure is how you measure information. So let's take a look more closely at how you quantify information. What is information? Well, information, as you see, <coughs> And the difference between the slide of the picture versus the noise, information, quite simply, is the dual of disorder. Now, of course, the first picture, that random pattern, it was complete disorder. But the second one, the image of the tree, there was structure there. The choice of pixels was not arbitrary as you go across the image. And so the wider the selection of different values that an observation can take on, the bigger its description. So why exactly is that? If we were to talk about the value that a pixel can take on, let's imagine we had an observation, and this observation can take on some number of values. And let's imagine for the sake of argument that this observation can take on 65,535 different values. And so if we had 65, 535 different values, in order to enumerate or represent these values, we're going to need 16 bits to do so. Why? Because 2 to the 16 is 65,535. Now let's contrast that particular observation with this observation. Let's imagine another observation, observation 2, can take on 256 different values. In order to represent this observation, we need 8 bits to enumerate them because 2 to the 8 gives us 256 different bit patterns or values. And so this is an exact example of the fact that the wider selection of values, 65,000 and change here, 256 here, the wider selection needs a bigger description, more bits. And so let's take a look at this distribution. Here we have a distribution that has substantial or significant probability mass associated with each value across the support set, this horizontal axis. And so it's very close to uniform. And if you were to observe a random variable governed by this distribution, you're going to have higher disorder of plurality of values, more values, different values, because this probability distribution is uniform. And the fact that it's uniform, it means that you're going to have representation in sampling from a broader range of values. So you're going to have a plurality, a wider range, and therefore you have many alternatives. So the more alternatives you have, be they outcomes 
or where you place probability mass in a distribution, there's going to be higher disorder for random variables sampled from this distribution. Now, let's take an example this other distribution. Here we see a lot more probability mass concentrated in the center, and as you tail off to the right, to the left, you have less probability mass, and it's effectively zero in certain places. So here you have far fewer set of alternative outcomes for a random variable that you could observe sampled from this distribution. So you have lower disorder, and this lower disorder is a way of saying more structure. You have lower disorder or more information because you have fewer alternatives. And so this uniform distribution looks more like that noise pattern, and this Gaussian distribution looks more like that image. There's structure there. There's less disorder. There's information. Okay, so let's take a look at a set of mathematical tools used to measure information. Now, information theory was initiated by Claude Shannon, and he worked for AT&T Bell Labs, which was the research arm of AT&T, Ma Bell as it was called. And he was enterprising to examine the early start of digital communications. And so here you have analog communications, which was a voice signal, and you wanted to digitize it. You wanted to represent it as bits. And so this analog signal would vary among frequency associated with the utterances for the voice or audio signal that was being transmitted. And so this idea that Shannon introduced was this notion of measuring the average number of bits that are needed to communicate a time-varying signal. And of course, a time-varying signal is well represented as a probability distribution over the values associated with that signal. So he developed what was called Shannon entropy, and entropy, Shannon entropy H, is minus the sum of all of the log probabilities weighted by the probability of an occurrence of an outcome of a random variable or sample. And so you can think of this as the expected log probability. If we look at this expression, it is an expectation. Here we have the summation across instantiations from our support set. We have the probability of value xi, and that's going to be an expectation of what? Expectation of the log of the probability of xi. Now we say log because we use log to represent the number of bits associated with a particular outcome, that outcome being the probability. All right. So you can think of Shannon entropy as the negative of the expected log probability. So if we think of two signals, let's call one signal governed by probability distribution P and the other governed by probability distribution Q. And for this consideration, let's assume distribution P and Q both operate over the same support set. So they're defined on the same set of values. Now, granted, P and Q might place more or less probability mass in, over different values, different regions of the support set, but they're defined over the same support set, X. So one of the things that we def want to represent is this idea of the compatibility or the agreement between two signals, P and Q. And so this notion of a so-called importance weight is a likelihood ratio between probability distribution P and Q, and this ratio expresses how much P and Q, our signals or distributions, agree on where they place probability mass over the support set, our domain X. And so let's think about this likelihood ratio. If this ratio, P over Q, of our observation XI is close to one, then that means signal P and Q agree that XI is important. Conversely, if this likelihood ratio is very small or very large, 
that means P and Q do not agree. They say that XI is not important. So they're going to agree on those elements of support set that are important. And so the important reasons of support set are where P and Q agree. The likelihood ratio is close to 1, our so-called importance weight. And so if you think about it, shared information between P and Q has something to do with those reasons of the support set where they agree. And so if we look at these two distributions, let's imagine the red distribution were P and the green one is Q, we notice that we have an overlap region here. And so this ratio is going to be larger for this shared region on areas of support where they agree. The more they agree, the more important that particular locus or locality within the support set, the more important it is. And so one of the other ways we can measure this notion of information, this connectedness, if you will, or relationship between two signals is this idea of the relative entropy or kullback leibler divergence. Now, this kullback leibler or Kale divergence is not a proper distance metric because it's not symmetric. It does not satisfy the triangle inequality. But nonetheless, our Kale divergence, Q relative to P, you can think of it as an expected log odds ratio, an expected importance weight. And this measures this idea of if you were going to take a signal Q and use it to pro approximate P, what is the average or expected extra bits that you're going to need to encode your signal P using samples from Q? If they are very different from one another, that set of bits is going to be larger. If they are very similar to one another, these importance weights are close to one, you're going to need fewer bits because Q and P are saying the same thing if they agree quite a bit. All right, so that's the kullback leibler divergence. Let's take a look at two signals, and we want to know the entropy or the disorder associated or the bits used to code a set of signals. And so the so-called joint entropy, H of X, Y, we have two signals, P and Q, and we have our sum, double summation, over all the X instantiations and the Y instantiations. We have our joint probability, P of X, Y, and we use that in our expectation of the log joint probability, P of X, Y. And so what this expected log joint probability is between random variables, X and Y, governed by signals P and Q, it talks about the uncertainty within a set of variables, the expected number of bits used to code the co-occurrence of two signals. All right. So this is our joint entropy. Now, we can take a joint entropy and we can look at this idea of the information coupling between two signals. Now, that's called mutual information between two random variables or signals X, Y governed by probability distributions, P and Q, respectively. And so the mutual information is just the expectation. So here's our probability. Expectation of what? The expected log odds ratio between two things, the joint probability and the independence assumption on that joint probability. And so this log odds ratio talks about the agreement between the independence assumption between these two signals, assuming they're independent, and the joint or the co-occurring assumption. And so what this does is it tells us how much one variable tells us about another variable. What does P say about Q? What does Q say about P? So if we were to take this expression and perform a little bit of manipulation, we get exactly this mutual information is the difference between the joint entropy and the sum of the individual entropies. And so that difference has to do 
was the coupling inherent in this co-occurrence between variables X and Y governed by distribution or signals P and Q. So one of the things that we find, we said before, that the Kale divergence is not symmetric. If we write the Kale divergence Q relative to P or P relative to Q, they're different from one another. The difference is, of course, the probability distribution we use for the expectation is different. Here it's P, here it's Q. And then if we look at the log odds ratio, here it's P upon Q, and here it's Q upon P. They're just different. It's not symmetric. And so one of the things that's done with the Kale divergence to try to compensate for this idea that it's not symmetric is this Jensen-Shannon divergence, or JSD. And what Jensen-Shannon divergence does it's the smooth, symmetric version of Kale divergence. And what do they do? They take one half the Kale divergence between signal P and some signal M, plus one half the Kale divergence between signal Q and that same signal M. So what exactly is this M? It's the midpoint distribution. It's that distribution you would get if you average distribution P and Q in terms of the probability mass they assign on some input. And so this jensen shannon divergence is also known as the smooth version of Kale divergence. Now, my graduate student and I developed a brand new information theoretic measure, something called the shishini jensen shannon divergence. And so here we took the jensen shannon divergence and we made the observation that this midpoint distribution is the arithmetic mean. And we said, okay, well, we know that the mean is brittle to outliers, and this brittleness shows up when you have subtle differences between two distributions. And so when you have those subtle differences, you need to dilate this measure. And how we dilate it is we replace the arithmetic mean with different sets of means drawn from the family known as Shini means. Uh, we... Geomet use geometric mean, harmonic mean, and those aren't the only means you can use as a replacement for the arithmetic mean from jensen shannon divergence. And so when you do this, what you end up doing with geometric mean and harmonic mean as a substitute, you take the range of jensen shannon divergence and you stretch it from the interval between 0 and 1 on the real number line to the interval between 0 and infinity on the real number line. So what exactly does that do? It dilates the Jensen-Shannon divergence so that subtle differences are much bigger, effectively stretching the ruler. And this new measure is immensely useful. We've proven propositions about it, and these proofs have also held true in theoretical applications as well as across a number of data domains. And so we're really excited about that, and we call it CJSD for Shishini Jensen Shannon Divergence. It improves upon Jensen Shannon Divergence. And it's particularly useful where the differences between signal P and Q are very, very subtle, very small. All right. So another very important and interesting class of information theoretic measures is the Bregman divergence, or so-called F-entropy. And what this F-entropy does, it assumes that you have a set of functions drawn from the set of convex functions. It's not for any function, but it's convex function. And what this does, this F-entropy, it allows you to go beyond just probability distributions to arbitrary functions, as long as they are convex functions. And so what this does is it allows you to define a notion of disorder or information content custom to data types where you design these functions to measure something about your signal. And so what is this F-entropy? What this F-entropy does, or Bregman divergence, it takes the rate of increase in a function between two points. So here along the horizontal axis, we have the domain of the function. We have a point V, and some point later, we have point W. 
And so the difference between W and V is W minus V. That's this distance. I'll just mark that with my pen. W minus V. And so what we do is we take the tangent of our function at point V. So that's the tangent. There's F of V. We take the tangent at that function at point V. There's our tangent. And we do one of two things. We make the linear assumption that if we take the slope or the tangent at point V on our function and we walk some distance W minus V along that tangent, assuming constant slope, how does that compare to the actual rate of increase to our function, which is F of W up here minus F of V? That's down here. And so we have f of w minus f of v. Here's f of w, here's f of v. And we compare that distance to the distance we get when we walk up this constant slope line, some distance w minus v. So if we walk at a constant slope w minus v, we're up here. And that difference, that's our f entropy or our Bregman divergence. And so here is our difference, the actual rate of increase between V and W of our function. And we're subtracting from that. Here's the constant slope at the tangent, the gradient of F of, of V, tangent to F evaluated at point V. And this is our distance times that slope. We're walking that amount along that slope, assuming a constant slope. And so our function is assumed to be convex, and the domain is a convex set, and the derivative of this function has to be monotonically increasing. And we end up with a measurement that's much more broad in measuring disorder or wiggliness, as you could think about it, for a function, and this lends itself well to measuring information content or the amount of disorder for a broader class of functions beyond just talking about probabilities using likelihood ratios and bits. Okay, so this is F entropy. It's immensely useful. You can use it for time series. You can use it for images. You can use it for all sorts of things, and it opens up a whole new world of opportunity to measurement of disorder uh, in signals. All right. So with that, we're going to make it a short one. We'll end there, and I will see you all on Tuesday.